How are you guys doing? Welcome our campus with us today, Facebook Live. We love Good you guys. Thank you so campus. much for being with us. You guys take a seat all over the auditorium. Super excited about today because we are covering a series entitled Heart for the House. Last week we talked about freedom. Hope you were here for that. If not, you can log on and, and check that out and listen to it. This week we're covering relationships. So I say relationships. And I happen to get the awesome opportunity and honor and privilege to share the platform today with my beautiful, intelligent, anointed, bright, wise, beautiful, beautiful wife, <laughs> Benet. Thank you, honey. You're welcome. <laughs> Meant it all, too. Thank you. You look hot today. Thank you, baby. You promised me you wouldn't do anything to make it weird, so keep going. Is it weird? <laughs> Is it weird? See, it's not weird. Hey, dang right it is. <laughs> that is the truth. You ought to live with them. <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, relationships. We're going to talk about marriages, but we're also going to talk about singleness. We're going to talk about relationship with God. We're just going to cover relationships by large. So if you're in here and you're single, please don't check out. Please don't log out because um, we're going to talk about some concepts and some things that Regardless of what relationship that you are in, and everybody has one, we have friends, some of us are married, some of us are married again, we're going to just talk about the difficulty of that and, and how we can experience better relationships if we kind of do them the way that God does them. So how many of you in here grew up playing with fire? Oh, wow, this is <laughs> kind of scary, a lot more in 11 o'clock than 9 o'clock. How many, as of right now, continue to play with fire? Awesome. Did you see all the students? I hope yeah. your parents saw all the students. There's a lot of teenagers that raise their hand, so uh, don't leave them at home. <laughs> hey, be, be cautious. We have, you know, some flammable items right here. Oh, I know. <laughs> and, and for real, this is <laughs> smarter starter fluid. <laughs> I think using starter fluid is smart anytime. How many, how many just believe in starter fluid? How many believe in gas? Gas makes the greatest fire ever. Okay, so it is true. There are, this is empty, okay? This is not. So if I were to do this yeah, no. on this very wet top. No, that, that wouldn't be It'd be, be nice. awesome. <clears throat> but there are a couple of things. How many of you are kind of like uh, nature people, people survivalists? Like you, you would dig being able to start a fire in the woods with no matches, no gasoline. Okay, not me. I think you should always bring matches and gasoline anywhere you go. But... There are three things that you have to have to create a fire. One of them is heat. Everybody say heat. heat. One of them is fuel, which is on the end of this match. Everybody say fuel. fuel. The other is oxygen. And when you put all of those three things together, you end up with fire. It's the greatest thing ever. Okay, so... You know, I just, I just thought of something. What? Several years ago, uh, we used to go to Sam's all the time to get a bunch of groceries because we were feeding these growing boys. And we came back from Sam's one day, and we had all these boxes. And Garrett I said, can I go burn them at the bottom of the hill? This is when we lived in Moulton. And so we had 15 acres. And Ivy said, sure, you can go burn them, but do not use gas. And he said, yes, sir, I won't use gas. So he goes away, and he gathers all the boxes. And he comes, before he comes back, we hear this boom, and it literally shakes our house. Like, no joke, it shakes our house. Garrett comes sprinting up to the back door, and his eyes are like this. He has no eyebrows. <laughs> he had that hair that, like, had the wave in it. All the front wave was gone, like, just. Have y'all seen Bugs Bunny, where it's, like, it's just blowed back? He had on, he had on a, a members-only jacket. Anybody remember those? I that forgot was, about Garrett's jacket. It was melted to his body. Honestly, the Lord protected him that day. What he did, he put all the boxes in a 50-gallon drum, put gas in it, and lit, went, bent over. This is so stupid. Never, ever do this. <laughs> Never do this. Bent over and lit it, and it just exploded. And, I mean, the Lord saved him. We can laugh about it now, but in that moment, it wasn't funny at all. Oh, I laughed at that moment. I wonder There's, where he learned to use gas on fires. Well, it'd be okay if you run a what, guys? That's not okay either. Just don't use, do not well, use gasoline. Perfectly fires. acceptable. No, I don't think so. In fire combustion 101. So anyway, we're going <laughs> to, it was great. So we're going to, 
He, you know what? You know what's awesome about that? He, he's 22. Mm-hmm. I bet you he'll never do that again. <laughs> but, like, it didn't do me any good to set him down and teach him how to life. He had to figure out all on his own. How many, how many just know that's you? You blow your face off one time with gasoline, you will never do that again for the rest of your life. So that is one lesson I don't have to worry about Garrett ever redoing or talk. He'll teach his sons <laughs> so well. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about today that inside of relationships, there are some combustible materials. There are flammable materials that we just need to learn how to extinguish. And there are a, there's a way that we can live in that. And so we're going to talk about how to take out or off the table the oxygen and the fuel. Because here's what we can't do. And nobody can do this. I can't take the heat out of the relationship. What do I mean? I can't, I can't take the friction that if we're going to live lives together and, and be in this space, whether you're married or you're just doing relationships, there's always going to be friction because you have two personalities trying to do life together. You have two philosophies, two ideas. I see it my way, you see it your way. So there's always going to be heat and friction, but there does not have to be oxygen and fuel, which becomes explosive inside of relationships. And that's, that's what we're going to cover today as we, as we talk about all these these things. Relationships are challenging. Who would agree with me? It doesn't matter if it's a relationship between you and your child, you and your teenager, if it's a relationship between you and your mom, your dad, your sibling, or if it's just a friend, or if it's your spouse, relationships are challenging. Because like I've said, you have two totally different personalities trying to do life together. You believe one way, they believe another way. You see out of a lens one way, they see out of a lens another way. And for us, we're a lot alike. How many people have uh, read the book, Make a Difference, that talks about the lion, the monkey, the turtle, and the camel? So a few of you in here. Well, that's four different personality types. The camel is the one who's really organized. The lion is the one, just a lion. And the monkey is the one that's, you know, the monkey all over the place, just having fun. Life's a party. And the turtle is wanting to go back in a turtle shell. It's too many people. Let me get away from all of you guys, the one in the corner. Well, we're not that. We're thoroughbred lions. And so when you put two thoroughbred lions together 24 years ago who did not know Jesus, you're talking about a lot of sparks and a lot of fire and a lot of combustion. There were fights upon fights upon fights. And then after we were saved, we still were fighting. And then after we were saved, we were still fighting. And I remember one time we had been married like 10 years, and I told him, I said, Babe, we are fighting over the same things that we've been fighting over for the past 10 years something's got to change. And he's like, I agree, so change. And I'm like, no, you change. (laughs) She just said something needed to change, so I I volunteered her to be the one to change. And then 15 years, we were like, okay, we've been married 15 years, and we're fighting about the same things. This is ridiculous. We've got to change some stuff. How can we learn to do this relationship different? And what we found is we were better to other people than we were to each other. I would have never talked to Pastor Lisa the way I talked to Ivy at times. He would have never talked to Pastor Rusty or Pastor Keith the way he talked to me at times. And I guarantee you guys, a lot of you would never talk to us the way you talk to your kids, the way you talk to your spouse, the way you talk to your friends if you're aggravated at them. But yet, we continually abuse the one relationship in marriage that's supposed to be holy and one and beautiful So we knew some things had to change. We knew we had the power to take some things off the table to not respond a certain way because we were doing it with other people, but we couldn't understand why we couldn't do it with each other. And this is what God revealed to us on our journey of marriage. And so she said something that I know mentally you you kind of jerked at or was like, no, 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 that's like, you don't understand, that's my kids, so I can talk to them that way. Or I'm, I'm in a marriage, so inside my, of course I will not talk to you like I talk to my wife or my husband because when I'm at home and I'm with my wife or my husband, I just get to be me. But, but when I'm in front of you, then I have to recognize that that's my pastor, so I have to talk this way. And when I'm in front of my boss, I have to talk this way. And when I'm um, somewhere else, I talk this way. But when, I'm, when, I'm, when, when, it's just, when it's just me and you, then I can let everything down and I can just be me. How many of you ever said that? Okay, so how many of you know what a filter is? A filter is designed to stop what? Say impure things. 
Like, it's only supposed to let out the good stuff. It stops all the bad stuff and lets all the good stuff. How many of you ever made coffee and your filter malfunctioned? And you didn't know it till it was too late, right? Like, you start drinking, like, ah, oh, you got to get off your tongue. Okay, so, so a, a filter is designed to stop the impure things from making it out. And, and we're all pretty good with our filters. They're like, we, we can slow things down and we can stop them in certain environments. But when we, when we say, hey, I'm, I'm with my wife, I'm with my husband, so I'm just me. What we're saying is, is I'm, I'm taking the filter down and you're going to get just what you get. The problem with that and what we discovered is this. How do you know the Bible's just... It's just... How do you know that? Like if you read something, you go, doggone it. The Bible says that whatever is in a man's heart or woman's, that's what it's talking about, comes out of their mouth. Now, here's what's so tricky. I'm really good with my filter until I'm under a lot of stress. How many know that? If, if I get stressed enough, my filter starts to break down, I will say all sorts of stuff that I would have swore were gone. How many ever had that happen in your life? Like, whoo! I can't believe I said that. Okay, the next place that your filter is broken down is when you're super relaxed, comfortable, and unaware. Where's that? Everybody say at home. At home. So here's what I need you to understand, and this is the reality that we had to face. Whatever is in a person's heart comes out of their mouth. Your core is being exposed. And when you say, oh, when I'm with you, I'm just me, you're saying, oh, when I'm with you, I'm really the turd that I am. <laughs> like, I'm just getting down to the core. Like, you're just seeing the real me now. How many of you remember dating your wife, dating your husband, and you put on the show? The filter was strong, wasn't it? Like, you didn't poot in front of them. You didn't burp in front of them. You, like, you opened the door maybe a few times. You dressed really good. You tried to put cologne on. You didn't want to smell B.O. I mean, you went through all this stuff, and he said all the right things. How many ladies? Did he not say all the right things? Don't lie. You married him. <laughs> Raise your hand. He said them. That's why you married him. Guys, she said all the right things, right? So the filter was there. And then some point in the marriage, what'd you find out? That ain't who I married. No, it's absolutely who you married. And what we have to do is get to the core if we really want to transform. You know, and even, think about that. I remember saying that one day to IV. I can just be me at home. And then I had this wake-up call. I was like, is this the me that I want to be? So I want to pose that question to you guys as we begin today. Is that who you want to be? That person that yells and screams and is going to throw something or going to tell somebody off or losing it with your kids, is that really who you want to be? Because that's what we're saying. This is me, and I'm okay with it. But on this journey, we have to start changing some things, and until we begin to change them at home, you're not going to have the desired relationships that you want. You're not going to have that peace that you want. This is the one place, and then with our kids, with our families, that we have to begin to put these tools to action, to take some things off the table and to put some things on the table. That's the one place that we've got to choose our filter. You don't want to love somebody else more than you're loving your own spouse. You don't want to love somebody else and be nicer to somebody else's kids. How many parents are in here? I found myself at times being nicer to your kids than I was being to my kids. And I had to think, listen, this is not who I want to be. And so God revealed these things to us. We're a work in progress, but we can give those to you today so you can have some great tools so that 2018 can be a completely transformational year from you, for you. Are you excited about that? <laughs> Me too. So it's not about getting a better filter. I don't want you to hear that. You don't need a better filter. <laughs> what you need is a change of what's coming out naturally. And we have to get to the heart. So how do I do that? I learned that I have the ability to take some things off the table. Now, if you're in here and you're a business person, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you know anything about business, you know what I'm talking about. Because we go, we engage in contractual talks as business people. And we come to that first meeting and we go, okay, what's on the table is business principles. All of those are the same. Doesn't matter what we're talking about, what's going on. And we go away and we go, yes. And then we schedule the next meeting. And we come back and we talk about the negotiables of the contract. And we go, okay, um, we can keep this on the table, we can keep this on the table. However, this is off the table. Here's what off the table means. That is not an option. We cannot discuss that, nor can you even think about it, because it's not relevant to what we want. 
That's what the term, we're going to take some things off the table, means in business. It's what it means in the natural, and it's also what it means in the supernatural. Inside Scripture, you're going to see principles where somebody said some things or made a, a, a phrasing statement. And the term off the table in Scripture reads this way. They purposed in their heart. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel said, I have purposed in my heart not to defile myself. He was faced with a choice to eat what the king wanted them to eat or to hold true to what he knew was right in the sight of God. And before he had to make the decision, he made the decision. He purposed in his heart. What he made that was not an option. And in Psalms, you'll see Psalms, you'll see this phrase that says, purposed in my heart. Um, I am purposed that my mouth, look at this, shall not sin or shall not transgress. How many know your filter is not that big? Really? Like, I can't make that statement. I can't say I purpose that my mouth shall not sin. Have you ever heard me talk? I mean, my Lord. Okay, well, then, then here's the fil filter's not, that's not the answer. Yeah. We have to have a heart change. And that particular phrasing, purpose in my heart, means I've decided not to do something. And then in 2 Corinthians, you'll see this phrase. It says, purpose in your heart, what to give. Everybody say give. That particular phrase in the Greek means to decide what I will do ahead of time. So, so the phrase purpose in my heart is the biblical principle of take it off the table. Make a decision before you have to make a decision. Because if you wait before you get in this explosive environment to make that decision, if it's still an option, you're going to make the wrong decision. That's right. So make it not an option. I don't even think about it. It's not even on my mouth. It's not on my tongue. It's removed from my ability to access it. It's not relevant to what I want. Mm -hmm. And we've already done that with several areas in our life. Let me make it practical for you. How many of you, when you go to the mall or you're at Walmart or at Target, wherever you're at, and you're shopping, maybe for a female, you see a blouse, and the first thing you think about is, I'm going to steal it because I want it. Or you see that purse. Take that? Raise your hand because we won't help you. <laughs> oh, you want a blouse, so you steal it? He's trying to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's talent just, back there for everybody that didn't know. Oh, no. You know, when you go to town and you're looking at something and you see something that you really, really want, maybe it's a purse that you can't afford, the first thought that comes to your mind is not, I'll just steal it. I can have it. Guys, when you go, maybe and you're looking at a boat or you're looking at a four-wheeler or you're looking at a gun or whatever it is you're looking at, your first thought is not, I'll just steal it. Because that's not an option in your brain, so you don't even think that way. You see where I'm going with this? For a lot of us in here... If you're going through stress or if you're going through marital problems or if you're, you know, your finances, you're having financial problems, your first thought is not, I'm going to shoot up heroin tonight. Because it's not an option to you. You don't even think like that. So it's not an option within your brain. Now, I know that there are some people here that stealing is still an option. Drugs are still an option. So our prayer today is if you're in here and that's still an option for you, you would see that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can absolutely take those off the table too. Mm -hmm. that's Amen. Right. So in, in our lives... Um, as you said before, we were not saved when we, when we got married. Some of you feel like, oh, yeah, I was not saved too. No, we were really not saved. We were really, 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 really lost. Um, and like I'm talking about didn't go to church um, growing up, not even really on Christmas and Easter, had no concept. But what we did, have a, what we did know is what we wanted. Um, now, we didn't know that to the full, but we knew we wanted something different and no dishonor to our parents, but both of our parents had gone through divorces, and we saw that that did not end well, nor did we want that. So one of the first things that we took off the table, literally, um, in our marriage before we were even saved was divorce. Like so much so, we w it was not even in our vocabulary. We never accessed the word. It was never an option no matter what argument we got in. It didn't matter how bad it had gotten or would get. We would say, this, this is the one thing we're just not going to do. So much so, we're not even going to talk about divorce. But for a lot of people, that's, that's an option for you. You've gone into marriage, and there's some single people in here who are not married yet, and you're going to go... Right now, for you as a single person, well, if it doesn't work out, I can always 
get divorced. I can trade in. I can trade up. I might trade down for a minute, but I can trade up again. Like it's like, like we view in society marriages like buying used cars. Like really, it, it's a, we say, oh, that's dumb. No, no, that's what they do. 50% of all marriages, Christian or non, end in divorce. Why is that? Because it's an option. Like, like, and here's what people do when I say that. Well, yeah, but you don't know my story. Yeah, but you don't know ours. It's true. Like, you really, you have no idea what the first five years of our marriage was like. She had, she had a lot of reasons. I didn't cheat on her, but she still had a lot of reasons to put my stuff on the front porch, which she did one time. <laughs> Divorce wasn't the option, but sleeping in the yard was. <laughs> right? So, but for us, it just became not an option because in Matthew it says... The two have become one flesh. What God has put together, let no man separate. Now, where's, where's all my married guys? Here's what I used to think, and how I viewed this verse until I had a massive revelation. I used to think, oh, yeah, let no man separate what God has joined together, which means if you flirt with my wife, I'm going to hand you your teeth back to you, when you well, after I take it from you. How many know what I'm talking about? Let no man come in between... Well, here's, here, literally, I was reading that verse one day, and God spoke to me loud and clear, and he said this, son, that means you. Yeah, that's terrible, <laughs> is what that is. <laughs> is when God reminds you, hey, I don't know if you know it or not, but I gave you my daughter to take care of, and I need your ignorance, your stupidity, and your arrogance not to come in between what I have put together. And I had to take responsibility for what my role was and what I was about. And it wasn't just taking divorce off the table, but it was a bunch of other stuff, little tiny stuff that leads to this. And that was one of the decisions that we made very early on. Another thing that was never an option for us on the table was having an affair. It just wasn't an option. And when something's not an option, the enemy can't tempt you with what you're not tempted by. Listen to what I said. The enemy can't tempt you with what you're not tempted by. Since it wasn't an option, in 24 years, we haven't walked through the temptation of an affair because it wasn't an option. It wasn't something in our mind that we could pick up if things were going bad. And so it wasn't an option to us. We saw what affairs had di have done to different people within our family, and we just knew. We, did, we didn't know really how to get what we wanted when we first got married, but we knew two things weren't options to us. And do you ever look back in your life, especially those of you that haven't been in church your whole life, and just thank God? Because he, that was His goodness. That was nothing within us, because... That we were so messed up at the time we got married, but God was so faithful and so good to us that he gave us these principles even when we were without him. Here's, I, I just want to, I want to say this to some people because, not because a fair is an option to you, but it, you need to understand that neither one of, neither one of us are blind. It's not like she doesn't notice guys that are handsome or I don't notice women that are beautiful, but because a fair is not an option, let me tell you what else is not an option for us. If, if a thought comes in about somebody of the opposite sex, I immediately tell her. Okay, wait, let's pause right there. Because I guarantee you most of the men, I'd say probably 90% of the men that are either logged on live or that are in here right now, somebody has told them, you can't tell her everything. If you were to tell her that, she can't handle it. You know, she, she loses it over this, she loses it over that. Like, you can't tell her everything. That's a lie to, so that you don't operate as one. Because here's the deal, men. If you don't tell her, you're still one flesh with her. So she knows something's going on. So she makes up within herself and in her mind what she thinks is going on. There have been numerous times throughout our marriage that I've gone to him. He's come to me and said, you know, I was walking this way and this guy walked by and I thought, well, he was handsome. And I went, oh my gosh, take that thought captive, replace it with the truth and, and don't allow it to hang out in there. That's not being tempted. That's the enemy trying to put something in your brain. You have to choose it and act on it, thinking on it literally before it becomes a temptation with you. And so if that happens to us, we go to the other one and I'll say, babe, you know, I was walking or I had a dream. Just the other night I had this weird dream and this random person was in it. So the first thing that I did was I said, babe, I had this dream and this person was in it and instantly I never thought about it again. So it's not nothing like, like... Nothing like waking up first thing in the morning and wife go, hey, I had a dream by another man. <laughs> That's not how that happened. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not how that happened. Kind of. No, it wasn't. Okay. 
just to put your mind at ease so nobody's wondering what were they they were we were just flirting but still that's a sin I mean don't flirt but in my dream so I said I the first thing I did was I said honey I need to tell you something I had this dream will you pray over me because I don't want that coming back I was asleep the enemy's trying to put something in my mind that's not who I am and he does the same thing to me and he he's not able just to tell me this because I'm a strong woman and and I know all this scripture or whatever you may be thinking why he can tell me this your wife can handle it too you don't know what God's doing within her trying to make her stronger trying to make her access his word and his truth so be honest be honest and wife when he's honest with you don't do what he's expecting you to do just love him and say thank you thank you for being honest with me I'm gonna pray for you don't hold it against him because there's no love in that mm. So the next thing that uh, we took off the table, because this was actually an option uh, for both of us when we were younger, is uh, porn. So today we have a porn grenade. Um, and the, the, <laughs> the reason it's a porn grenade is because in the natural, a hand grenade, if thrown into the middle of this room, will kill everything, kill everything within three to five meters of it. It'll wound everybody in this room. But in three to five meters, it'll kill you. So a porn inside your life will kill everything in three to five meters of your life. But it'll wound a lot farther than that. So this was an option that we had to take off the table that we had put on the table because I watched porn as a young man. I watched it as a college student. Um, we were told through the world and, and, and philosophically, if you want some spice to your marriage, then both of you watch porn together. The only thing porn does is give you unrealistic expectations that neither of you can fulfill. Yes. That's all it does. It destroys your life. Um, so we had, to we had to then take that off the table. And so now we're moving into... Um, things that come off the table regardless of where you're at, whether you're married, you're single, single again, married again, does not matter what relational journey you're on. Porn needs to come off the table. So we're not going to make this a, a huge porn conversation, but I do want to invite all married couples to um, our recreate marriage what we call conference. It? conference, marriage conference that we'll be having. And we will dive into really deeply um, sex in the confines of marriage, how to, um, how to have conflict without having a fight. Like you need to have healthy conflict, like a whole bunch of stuff. So when is it? It's at March 9th and 10th. It's Recreate. And here's what we're not doing this year. We're not having a, a theme to it. It's going to be very simple, very practical. We're having our friends, Ilya and Derek, pastors Ilya and Derek, fly in. And he actually, and he'll share this with you guys, but he had 10 affairs on her. And they are married today, happy and healthier than they've ever been. And they're going to tell you the tools that God used to restore, recreate, and do all kind of amazing things within their marriage. But it's March 9th and 10th. This weekend only, it's $40 per couple. And what that did is that covers your food. It covers dinner for that night, that Friday night, breakfast for Saturday morning, and the child care. Because we believe in it that this much. We, want, we don't want to add any fluff, any decorations, any band. It's going to cost you guys extra because we want everybody to be there. This is not just an epic thing. It's open to everyone. So make sure you sign up for this. You can go to any of our social media pages. You can sign up. You can stop by Next Steps if you want more information about that. Moving into the next thing that we had to make a choice and have to continually make a choice every single day to keep off the table is this right here, being offended. Now, how many people even believe that you can take this off the table? Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they who love thy word, and they shall not be offended. They I'm what? Say, oh, man. <laughs> they shall not be offended. This was the one thing and is the one thing that continues to add fire to our marriage if we allow it. Because people think, They're, you're going to say this. You're just going to hurt my feelings. You're just going to offend me. That's how life is. No, I can make a choice that your words, they don't have to offend me. I don't have to pout. I don't have to cry. I don't have to get my feelings hurt. I can literally not be offended. And when this realization came to me, it was several years ago, I was speaking at one of our staff meetings, and I, I was talking about how 
it's amazing how we work with all of these women. And, and, and there's a lot of men on our staff too. But I was speaking directly to the women. I'm like, and you know, not one time in all of these years have any of you ever hurt my feelings. Or, and I've never got offended by you. I just purposed in my heart that I would not let you offend me. Because I wanted this to be a healthy and a happy environment. And then I went on to say this. But those boys of ours, I'm telling you what, they can break my heart. I mean... They hurt me deeper than I've even known pain before. I mean, I just, sometimes I don't even like them. I don't even want to look at them. The, those Marsh boys we're raising, you know, they just <laughs> offend me, hurt me. And even then when I got home that night, I, I was talking to Ivy. I said, you know what? I do get my feelings hurt a lot at home, don't I? <laughs> He's like, yes. And I'm like, and I don't get my feelings hurt at work. But you hurt my feelings. You offend me. I pout at you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a baby. I'm a sissy at home. Like I'm this big mess of a baby at home. And I'm giving all you guys the best of me. And at home, I mean, I'm an infant pooping my pants. I'm just a mess. I'm a baby. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. If I can choose a response in a world full of people that don't love me, then how in the world can I not choose a healthier response in a world of people who do love me? And I'm not saying this is easy. I'm saying it gets easier. If you make a choice, you know what? I do. I, I have great love for God's word, and I will not be offended. If you purpose that within your heart, then you don't try to access it all the time. If somebody says something to you, this is how I had to change it in my mind. If one of the boys, say if Josh or Garrett or Ella, if, if they said something to me and it was ugly, I had to think, Lord, what are you teaching me right now? Now, I still have to discipline them, but I would think, Lord, what are you teaching me right now? Where before my, uh, my option would have been, oh my gosh, they're so mean to me. A mom trying to raise kids and I'm pouting, acting like a kid younger than them. I'm not going to talk to you the rest of the day because I don't like you right now. <laughs> and we all do it. And it's so stupid, you know, seeing it lived out up here. It's like, oh, my gosh, I've been deceived. That's so dumb. I don't have to live like that. Or with my husband, if he was to say something to me, I wouldn't think, oh, I love him so much. I'm going to pray that he gets some rest because obviously he's just tired. He's a little snippy. I would think, how dare you? You're nice to all of them, but you're just mean to me. So I'm not going to talk to you either. I'm just going to pout. But when I flipped it in my brain and I really started thinking the best, and started asking God, God, what are you teaching me? I'm praying, Lord, help me to be all you want me to be. Lord, I want to serve you well. I want to represent you well. I want to be a shining light on a hill. And he goes, okay, I'm going to put a little pressure on you and let's see what's in there. And I was choosing to be a baby. But we don't have to make that choice anymore. You can absolutely choose not to be offended. In any situation, no matter how ugly it is, no matter how mean it is, you can make a choice not to be offended. Offense is a lot like ammunition. Um, you'll let it build and build and build and build, and you'll get offended one time, and you'll shoot somebody 72 times with everything that you've built up. Here's how, parent, here's how parents do it. If your kids have ever offended you, here's how I can tell you they have. They said something, did something, and you grounded them for two years. <laughs> have you ever done that? You're grounded for two years. You can't go on a date till you're 65. Get to your room. I mean, you just come out with this outlandish punishment that does not fit what they actually did, which is why it's so important for us as parents to make the decision before you have to make the decision. You should already have laid the groundwork for your kids. If you do X, Y, Z, here is the consequences. And that way, I don't go into it mad. I just say, oh, you chose that means you chose that. Now you're grounded for seven days. Go to your room. No electronic. No, like whatever it is. But... This makes you make ridiculous emotional decisions, which is why you have to take this next one off the table, which is losing self-control. How many of you know losing self-control is like pouring gasoline on fire? Like there's already a fire, but it's already hot. We've already got a lot of friction, and you blow up and you lose it. What happens? It just gets worse, right? How many, how many of you ever blown up on a problem and it made it better instantly? You're like, look at there. Pouring gasoline on that actually does work. I know. No, it never works. And so in the natural, we can see that pouring gasoline on a fire is very dangerous. 
they say. But um, in the supernatural, we don't understand that when we choose to step outside the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control, we throw, we throw gas on the fire. How many of you in here went to school? Awesome. Everybody. Okay. How many of you were doing pretty good in a, in a particular class and got a zero? Who ever got a zero? If you're normal, raise your hand. If you're like super intelligent, probably never. But like, I got lots of zeros. You know what's you know what's terrible about a zero? You can be rocking along with an 81 average, get a zero, and go straight to 60. <laughs> you ever notice that? Like everything's going great. Forget that homework. Don't show up for that test, or just don't study for the test, or you know however that works for you. Get a zero, and it's like, oh my B just became an F. It's funny. In the supernatural, that's true too. It's called the fruit of the spirit. Because here's what we say. Oh, you know, I'm really working on patience. I mean, no, that's my worst one. And then now I'm working on, you know, but I got self-control pretty good there. I enjoy I'm pretty good there. Well, look, it's not fruits. It's one classroom. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And if you got a zero and one, well, I mean, you know what a zero does, even if you've got a hundred and one. If you got a zero and one, a hundred and one, what's that? That's a 50. You're scoring 50. That's not good because God cares about the whole person. And we had to learn this because we lacked a lot of self-control. She can throw a shoe like you cannot imagine. <laughs> could, could, could throw a shoe. I was pregnant with Garrett. He's 22 years old. No, no, wait a minute, old. wait a minute. That's no, no, not like I excusing. threw a shoe you're excusing 22 right years ago. <laughs> I haven't thrown a shoe since. So, Or like the time that you threw the... Uh, Weed eater. Yeah. Remember the weed eater? You threw the weed eater? Okay, so look. <clears throat> she, she threw a shoe at me one time, hit me in the back of the head. <laughs> I picked up a love seat, throw it across the living room. I mean, it was crazy. You're talking about losing <laughs> self-control? Because here's what we believed. We believed, you know what? We're just passionate people, so we're passionate about everything. <laughs> so we're just going to be this way. What we didn't realize and, and what we try to teach you guys and what we know now is your purpose always trumps your personality. Yeah. And our purpose is to bring glory to God throughout the earth. And if you're throwing a shoe, if you're throwing a weed eater, <laughs> somebody's going to see it. <laughs> and you're not bringing glory to God. But you have to believe that you have self-control. I was just talking to a lady after service and she's like, yeah, self-control, you know, I don't have that. I'm like, are you a believer? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, then you have self-control. You've believed a lie. Mm -hmm. She said, well, I may have self-control, but I certainly don't have patience. I said, yes, you do. You're not accessing patience because you believe the lie that you don't have patience. God says, here is what you are. So you have to believe it, and then you'll walk in it. But if you believe you don't have these things, then you'll consistently give yourself permission to lose control. But you don't have to lose control. You can ab absolutely stay in control at all times. Here's what I found true in my life. Most of the time, I would try to find an excuse to lose than a reason to win. Like, I don't have self-control. I don't have patience. I was this way. It was this. I'm looking for an excuse to lose instead of just living in the reason God gave me to win. Like, like, like that was true. So the breaking point for us, I think, like she, I, she really is better with time frames and dates. I think it was the throwing of the weed eater. I was so, I don't even remember what it was over. You know, that's what's dumb. You lose self-control and you black out. How many know that? It's like, I don't even remember what's over. Okay. So she said something or I was doing something. I was probably doing something dumb. This is the truth. And she came out and addressed my dumbness, which aggravated me. I lost self-control. And I slung the weed eater so hard that I snatched my own feet from under me. How many ever got so mad you hurt yourself? <laughs> like, I, I, listen, I chunked, I chunked that weed eater, and it went forever. But when I did, I, like, I, literally, I slung it. And when I did, this foot, not this foot, this foot left the ground. I spun in the air, landed flat on my back on a concrete driveway. Hurt. And I've told you guys I have inappropriate laughter syndrome. <laughs> I can laugh at the most unopportune times, and I was crying laughing. I'm glad you think that's funny. I'm so glad you, as he's laying on his back, I'm glad you think that's funny. <laughs> but in that moment, we knew we had crossed a line. I don't know if you've ever been there before where you get so mad that you get violent, and you know you've crossed a line. <laughs> or you're so mad, and you just say some hateful, mean things that you know you don't mean. 
but you cross that line. So we knew we were playing with fire, and it was going to cross a line that would be very, very hard uh, on our marriage. Not that we would get divorced, not that we would separate, but just to heal the wounds that would happen if we continued to respond with losing self-control like we were responding. So, so we knew that day that we had to completely change and take some options off the table. The last one, and we could go into this much, much more of, of different things which we're going to recreate, but for this morning, the last one that we had to choose to take off the table that really, really changed our marriage and changed our relationship was dishonor. God calls us to love one another. He calls us to speak highly to one another. And dishonor does not do that. We never have permission. We never have permission to call your girlfriend, ladies. You never have permission to call your girlfriend and go, he is such a jerk. He, he blows all our money. He does this. He does that. Or let him be the, the brunt of the joke in front of somebody. You never have permission to dishonor them. Men, you never have permission to dishonor your wife. Well, she won't do this, and she won't do that, and she's lazy, and she don't even cook for me anymore, and she just rolls over and goes to sleep at night, or whatever it is. You never have permission. Mm -hmm. You've got to stop giving yourself permission. You have to take the option of dishonor off the table. And when you take it off the table where there's not dishonor, then there's honor. Yeah. If you're not choosing words of dishonor, then you're choosing words of honor. And whatever we speak happens. So if you're speaking honor to your husband, if you're speaking honor to your kids, if you're speaking honor to your wife or your friends, whatever it may be, the relationship completely changes. But this is not something that needs to be on the table any longer. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Words do hurt, and they hurt really deeply. Mm -hmm. And there are deep wounds that takes people sometimes, you know, a little bit to get over. So completely take this off the table. And the scripture says that we are to honor one another above ourselves. And that word honor in that particular phrasing means to prefer. Mm -hmm. That I prefer B'nai over preferring myself. That she prefers me over pre preferring herself. That I, that I place her needs and, and what she desires and what she wants above my own. I prefer her. And when you do that, it's an unbelievable thing. So much, it's come off the table so much for us that even when we take the platform and we're communicating and telling stories, and I'm like, you know, she, she threw the shoe, or, or she'll say, well, you threw the weed eater, and we walk back through things that are really far and removed from who we are right now, it feels dishonoring. But we literally have to have a conversation prior to communicating to you guys, hey, I just want you to know, I'm, I, this, God brought this story to mind. I think it would be a good analogy to help people understand where we've come from and where God has us, and she'll say the same thing to me. But I don't want to dishonor you, so if you're uncomfortable with that, I'll just not share it. I'll move on. And so, and so it's really, it's even difficult for us to share and be open while we know that's the secret sauce because the Bible says you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. So, so God's no respecter of persons. Where he has brought us today out of a very dark place and leaving all these, most of these things on the table, he will do for you. It's not that he can, it's he will do it yes. for you if you'll just allow him and partner with the Holy Spirit and go, those things are not an option for us, for me, anymore. And, and you really can extinguish all the flammable stuff, but you have to then start asking yourself, what is the thing that I can leave on the table? What does the Bible say? The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers, suffers violence. And violent, and violent men. men take it by force. Violent men. You have to make a decision that these are not options for me any longer. And I hope through this silly illustration that you can remember that you have the power to do this. That it's not options for you. You can put out these flames that the enemy is sending to you. You have the power mm -hmm. to do that. You have the power. You're not going to do it perfectly, but you have the power. But you have to take that by force. The one thing that you need to, after you've taken all those things off the table, the one thing you have to leave on the table is love. Yeah. We... We can take off the table all the fuel 
and all the oxygen where there's no explosion in your marriage or in your relationships, but there's always going to be heat. And here's the cool thing about leaving love on the table. Love turns heat into passion. Are we passionate? Yes. In every area of our lives, we are passionate. But we work very hard in submitting ourselves to God and to one another to ensure that we don't blow each other up. Because I love her, and she loves me. And more importantly than that, we each love God, and we want to be our best for him. And when we do that, we become our best for each other. But only if you leave a love on the table. What inside your relationship is covering up, snuffing out, exploding, burning up the love that is already there? Is it offense? Is it porn? Is it, you know, divorce is just an option, which creates unstableness in, in a marriage that just shouldn't be there. There should be foundation built on love and security that no matter what happens, because I made a promise for rich or for poor, sickness and in health, till death do us part. And you know what's cool about marriage violence? Nowhere in there does it say, but, does it? It says, I'm going to stick with you through thick or thin, no matter what. And then we all read the definition of love out of 1 Corinthians 13. Have you ever noticed that's just a traditional thing to do, but we so don't listen to it. What is love, babe? Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not rude. It's not boastful. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't keep any records of wrong. God gave me a big revelation just a couple of years ago. I was reading God's Word one morning. I was reading about love. And we love everything. We love cheeseburgers. We love french fries. We love shoes. We love church. We love this. We love that. We love, we love, we love, we love. And I think that we say the word love so much that we've cheapened what love really is. But I was reading that one morning, and I was doing a devotional, and I went to IV, and I don't, don't, don't do what I do because I really, sometimes I get excited and I don't explain myself well. So he gets up. I get up usually about an hour before him and he gets up and I'm like, babe, babe, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. And he's like, okay, what? And I'm like, I was reading God's word this morning and God revealed to me that I've never really loved you. <laughs> and he goes, what? What? I went, no, 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 no. Like I've always <laughs> loved you, but I've always <laughs> loved you the best way that I knew how. But I've, I've loved you. I've loved you in, in situations differently than God calls me to love you. I haven't loved you consistently the way God's word calls me to love you. Because love is patient. And you are probably the one that I've been the least patient with. Love doesn't keep any records of wrong. And for a long time, I kept a lot of records of wrong. Love isn't arrogant. Love isn't rude. And I said, you know, babe, I really need to repent for not loving you the way God's called me to love you. And I'm going to do the very best I can to love you the way God's called me to love you. And there's something powerful that happens in relationship and in, in with your spouse when you get them by the hands and you look them in the eye and you tell them, I repent. And I'm going to love you with everything that I have. And I'm not going to be self-seeking. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to keep records of wrong. I'm going to be kind. When you do that... There's something very powerful that happens. And God called us to repent to several other people that were in our lives of just not loving them through God's definition of love. When you love that way, there is so much peace. Mm -hmm. You're not uptight about anything. You're not aggravated about anything. And listen, we don't get it right a lot of times. We get in fights. We get mad at each other. We get frustrated with each other. But the one thing that we've made a commitment to do is when we blow it, to let that be very short. Very short. Our response to our reaction to be very short and to come back and not say, I apologize. Because anybody can say, I apologize. Because really when you say, I apologize or I'm sorry, I apologize and I'm sorry for what you've done. How many know sorry? And then you're like, wait, I, well, give it back to me. Yeah, when I say I'm sorry, I'm waiting on you to what? 
say you're sorry too, right? I'm sorry. And so here's what we did. In our progression to grow, really, we would say, I'm sorry. And then we found out, like, through Holy Spirit and growing, okay, so that means I'm, I'm apologizing for what you did because I was more right than you, but I'm going to say I'm sorry, and then you're going to say you're sorry to me, and now we've earned the right to come back together. So we left, we took I'm sorry off the table, and we left I apologize on the table because that was, that was a step up because if I apologize, now that, that's a much deeper, at least for us, this is just our journey. And then we started saying I apologize, but there still was that waiting on you to apologize, and then God showed us in his word, I never called you to say I'm sorry. I never instructed you to apologize for anything. I said in my word that I bring you to repentance. And repentance is all about what I've done. My responsibility for sinning against God and his gift into my life. And when you come and you say, babe, I repent. There is no expectation of her saying anything or doing anything because it's all on me anyway. I'm not apologizing. I'm not saying I'm sorry to make her feel guilty. You know how many times I would say I'm sorry to say I'm sorry first so she'd feel bad? You know how many times we'd apologize to be the first one? But now if we go and we repent, that's because I've been with God and I see my sin and that I have come in between what God has joined together. And I need to turn from that and do something different. So maybe that's for somebody in this room. That inside your relationships and your marriage, stop saying, I'm sorry. I apologize. Because that's not it. That's not the call to health and wholeness. The call to health and wholeness is, I repent because I've sinned against God and you. That's beautiful. We want you guys to have a beautiful, beautiful marriage. We want you to have healthy relationships all around you. And we're giving you some tools. We're peeling back layers of what God's been doing in our life, what he continues to do in our life, because we want to be able to help you. That's what God's called us to do. As your pastors, that's what God has called us to do. But we love you. We believe in you. You can have great and wonderful and beautiful relationships. You don't have to be tense and stressed and mad all the time. There's no peace in that. You can have healthy, beautiful relationships. But you got to take personal responsibility, what your responses are going to be. Regardless if he chooses to take offense off the table, regardless, it, whatever he chooses to take off the table, that's not my problem. That's not what I'm accountable to. I'm accountable to God from what I choose to take off the table. So please don't send me the email going, you don't know how bad he is. I could take it off the table if he'd act right. No. You're accountable to God as God's daughter. You're accountable to God as God's son on what you leave on the table. Take personal responsibility and quit giving yourself these options. And I promise you, circumstances will start changing. I yeah. promise you. More than that, peace in your heart is what will start changing very quickly. Let's pray, guys. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for giving us the gift of Holy Spirit to empower us to truly purpose in our hearts to take off the table things that are explosive and flammable in our lives. That every relationship with inside marriage, friends, even relationship with you, God, would grow and blossom into this unbelievably beautiful journey that manifests itself into the earth as life to the fullest. God, may you be glorified today in everything that was said and done. Holy Spirit, seal this teaching to the hearts of everyone on the sound of my voice that we would be better because we were here today. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen.